Welcome back and welcome to Talk of the Nation. Now, early this year, government proposed to make Swahili mandatory in schools as the country continues to leverage on its position in East Africa, where the language is a regional lingua franca. So this evening, we would like to understand what it will take to make this possible in schools across the country. And to help us appreciate this, we are joined by the KIU Vice Chancellor, Professor Muhammad Mpenza Mihigo. Good evening, sir, and welcome to Talk of the Nation. Good evening, and welcome our viewers, and thank you for hosting me tonight. Professor, for starters, I uh, would like us to have an overview of how uh, the oper of, on the operation of Kiswahili as a language, uh, you know, across schools in the country, because uh, this is not something new to us. No. It's been here because not so long ago I was in school and uh, yes, senior one, senior two, and Kiswahili was one of the subjects that uh, you know, I got to study. So how are we doing so far in terms of Kiswahili as a language? Uh, first of all, I think it's very important for us to uh, realize that uh, knowing a second, third, or fourth language just at a personal level is so important. It's an asset, it's an investment. And uh, Swahili, uh, for people who are viewing us, Swahili uh, is being used by more than 200 million. Actually, the statistics show that it is the leading, the largest language spoken in Africa. Uh, the other language that competes with it a bit is uh, uh, the one Hausa, which is spoken in Western Africa, Nigeria. and uh, Arabic, which is part, largely part of North Africa, but those countries are not as populous as our region. So that's a big thing. And um, in terms of uh, uh, the continent, now African Union has actually adopted English as an official language. Uh, the UN has gazetted 7th of July as uh, Kiswahili language World Day. And 7th July has got uh, a, a historical link. Uh, Mwalim Julius Nyerere actually uh, declared Swahili as a tool mm. uh, for independence when they were fighting for, uh, you know, against the colonial masters. So that has been gazetted. When we get back home, Uganda has also now revived. You know, the interesting bit about us here is that we go back and forth, back and forth. With the uh, we, we, Swahili. You know, with Swahili, and uh, there is less commitment. But I think Why now... Why is this? Uh, I, I, don't, I don't understand, but really the historic reasons. Uh, Swahili, first of all, was linked to bad, you know, threats, uh, the military, and then also, you know, whoever wanted to mistreat a person, they would use this language. And most people think it's just from the time of Amin. Amin belonged to the, the King African Rifle Army, Rifles Army, which uh, used to work with the colonial masters. Mm -hmm. So the British had an opportunity to communicate with the army, the African Rifles. Amin was a remnant, was one of those, you know, people who had been brought up in that army. And so because Swahili is largely made up of African languages, uh, then about, it is contested, 25 to 40% actually they say is made up of Arabic uh, text. Mm. And the reason for the Arabic integration in Kiswahili is basically because of the Arab trade. You know, they went into the hinterland, mm. and I'm sure you know this common saying that Swahili was born in uh, Zanzibar. You know, it grew up in Tanzania, it fell sick in Kenya, <laughs> it died in Uganda, and buried in DRC. But of course, we don't know who created this joke, but it gives you the quality of the Kiswahili spoken. Uh, from the coast, the coastal people speak, we can say, more uh, uh, close to the original Kiswahili compared to us in the hinterland. It, come, it goes on diluting, diluting and diluting. and becoming more Africanized. And, and now you, know? you, you talked of it dying in Uganda. <laughs> exactly. Because, <laughs> <laughs> because as, um, <laughs> something that concerns us is actually uh, the fact that uh, Uganda yes. is known to have like the largest number of Kiswahili. Isn't that, isn't that amazing? It is amazing, yes. but you find that a handful of us Right. Professor, on a joke, sorry. Mimi na kelewa vizuri. So you find that me and you <laughs> yes. are probably the only we ones We are very few out of, yes. yes. I, th I think the issue, the Ugandan education system has its own challenges. We've, I mean, we've been able to come through it. We've done a lot of contributions. But if a subject, a language is taught for just being examined, I mean, people will pass with an A in Kiswahili, mm. but they wouldn't construct a single sentence. So where are we as, as a country? I think this time around, 
if we are interested in making Kiswahili and being part of the East African community and going into the Federation, there has to be a deliberate, you know, deliberate effort. If you want to achieve anything in life, there has to be a deliberate effort. Now, what should be done? Uh, basically, we should be able to say what do we need. The teachers, if we have the largest number of teachers, mm. that's excellent. Are they prepared? Two, are they prepared? Do we have incentives? Because if we provide incentives, and also remember now the East African region is growing bigger and bigger. We have added DRC, we added Southern South Sudan, Sudan, and Somalia all is soon coming exactly, on board. exactly Sudan maybe, and and other Somalia. Sorry, Somalia is likely to come on board. Now that means. The, the commonest language within this region will be Kiswahili. Mm. Now, as Ugandans, we have to position ourselves and say, okay, what do we do? Universities must, like we teach communication skills, we teach fundamentals in, of computing f across the board, you know? We, we have to mainstream this. Uh, for the schools, we should pr probably, like the uh, South Koreans do, what they do, they deliberately choose and pay highly teachers of Kiswahili. Ah. I know now the drive is about science. Si yes. <laughs> I was going to say now <coughs> when you bring that in. Yes, but but uh, for the regional benefit, we, we probably have got to isolate Kiswahili and give it prominence, look for specific, you know, interventions that are going to support the use of the language. A language can die. A language evolves. So if we don't speak Kiswahili, in the marketplace, in schools, you know, in the transportation system, and love, you know, come to love the language and admire it, you know, promote it, do sensitizations. This commitment is probably going to go back to the shelf, as it has always been for centuries. Mm. So, Professor, do you uh, foresee or do you envisage a mm. time when almost all learners are actually uh, familiar with the Kiswahili language? Yeah, Given I the fact that now it's going to be made compulsory. I think let's start, let's start with the primary schools and the kids enjoy it mm. because they learn quickly and they are able to speak it and go and you know, interact with the parents. Then the secondary school is a subject, a compulsory subject. Now if it becomes compulsory, just like there was affirmative action for science subjects, you know, mm. in the past you could make some choices. Now it is compulsory and also the revised curriculum should endeavor to make sure that we push uh, for, for the, you know, for Swahili as a language that is going to actually enhance uh, the, 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 its usage, first of all. It's a commercial language. We know that it's so rich in culture. Do you know how much Kiswahili has influenced our dishes, our way of dressing? Uh, the unfortunate bit and, and part of the history is that some people feared Kiswahili as a language because of its close connection with Arabic. And Arabic, some people equate that to Islam, which is actually incorrect. Arabic as a language is a language, mm. although the language of Islam is Arabic, so they are not equivalent. So some people are actually really not uh, particularly interested, and some even had scares. They say, now, this word, for example, shukran, shukran is thank you, is a similar word in Arabic language. You know, so these are some of the stereotypes that have actually affected uh, the adoption or the picking up of Kiswahili, and I think this is a big effort. Now it is compulsory. Cabinet, I think, are taking some lessons. As understand? Well. Yes. Parliament should take. And what we should be seeing, you know, big media houses like NTV should be able to come, uh, you know, come out and say, okay, we now have to host news in Kiswahili mm. and we get volunteers. We have programs just like the way we are promoting uh, different aspects of our society and also civil society. Like they said, uh, science is the answer. It turns out that uh, Kiswahili is also going to be part, you know, it's going to be referred to as the answer. <laughs> right. Yeah, when it comes to, you know, the integration in the East African community. Well, thank you so much for joining us. We did have uh, Professor Mpenza Mihigo uh, Mohammed from KIU. He is the Vice Chancellor of Kampala International University. We do take a break and return with NTV Weekend Edition.